Good afternoon. It's Monday, January 30th. I'm Arya O'Sullivan, and this is IBA News broadcasting from Jerusalem. At the request of Knesset Speaker Yuli Edelstein, the much-debated settlement regulations bill that retroactively legalizes some 4,000 homes and settlements in Judea and Samaria will come up for a vote in the Knesset plenum tonight. This despite an earlier announcement by the coalition head Knesset member David Bitan, who first said the vote would be postponed until tomorrow due to a busy voting session in the plenum. The controversial legislation refers to settlements built on private Palestinian land in Area C under Israeli control. If approved, the bill provides financial compensation to Palestinian landowners. At yesterday's cabinet meeting, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who in the past was reluctant to support the bill, called for its advancement saying the law is designed to normalize the status of Jewish settlements in Judea and Samaria once and for all. Opponents of the bill have accused the government of trying to implement a form of annexation, calling it a bad and cowardly move that endangers the Jewish state. The bill is not applicable to the Amona outpost because the High Court of Justice has already ruled that the homes there must be demolished and has ordered the evacuation of families from the Hilltop outpost by February 8th. Meanwhile, hundreds of Israelis from settlements in Judea and Samaria, rabbis and council heads, join residents of Amona today in a march from the Israel Museum to the Knesset to protest the government's plans to evacuate the illegal outposts next month. Under the banner, we will not allow Amona to fall a second time, protesters warned they will not cave into the government's plan to erase the 20-year-old's community. The protesters who initially reached a compromise with the government to evacuate the hilltop community without violence have since reneged on the deal after plans by the government to move Amona residents to a nearby hilltop fell through. The Supreme Court ruled that Amona must be dismantled by next Wednesday. The protesters warned that thousands of settler homes in Judea and Samaria are threatened with destruction and called on the government to lift the threat and to stop treating settlers as second-class citizens. Attorney General Avichai Mandelbit informed Prime Minister Netanyahu yesterday that if the settlements regulation bill is passed, he has no intention of defending it before the High Court of Justice. Mandelblit has expressed a number of reservations in the past concerning the regulation bill, saying it violates local and international law and described it as unconstitutional. The Attorney General also warned it could harm Israel if it is brought up before the International Court of Justice in The Hague and possibly lead to the prosecution of Israelis. The Israeli Arab perpetrator of the fatal shooting of an Israeli and seriously injuring of another in Haifa on January 3rd hated Jews, the Shin Bet security agency revealed today. Mohammed Shinawi, a 21-year-old resident of Haifa neighborhood of Hilsia, deliberately shot 47-year-old Guy Kafri, a school bus driver, and Haifa rabbinical court judge 48-year-old Yichiel Iluz. Kafri was pronounced dead at the scene, and Iluz was seriously wounded. Days after the attack, Shinawi handed himself over to the police. This morning, the, Haid, the Haifa District Court indicted him of charges of murder, attempted murder, and the use of firearms for terrorist purposes. The Shin Bet said Shinawi turned to religion and admitted to setting fires to Israeli vehicles during the Second Lebanon War in 2006. The Jerusalem District Court today handed down a life sentence and an additional 20 years in prison to East Jerusalem terrorist Khaled Kutina for the murder of Shalom Shirki in Jerusalem in April 2015. The terrorist rammed his car into a hitchhiking station at French Hill, killing Cherokee on the spot and seriously injuring his girlfriend, Shira Klein. Coutinho was convicted of murder and attempted murder. He was also ordered to pay compensation of 258,000 shekels to each of the victim's families. The army announced today the arrest of four Palestinian residents of Jilazun in the West Bank area of Ramallah, responsible for throwing firebombs at the settlement of Beit El earlier this month. Their arrest came after a military observation post spotted the four throwing the firebombs, and soldiers dispatched to the scene pursued the perpetrators who abandoned their cars during the chase and were arrested several days later. Meanwhile, in widespread raids in the West Bank overnight, security forces arrested 19 Palestinian fugitives suspected of being involved in terror attacks and disturbances. Three of the suspects are affiliated with Hamas. Also overnight in Ramallah, soldiers raided two print shops responsible for issuing inciting material on behalf of Hamas. And in Hebron, security forces sealed off a weapons manufacturing facility. Meanwhile, U.S. President Donald Trump's recent executive order barring citizens of seven predominantly Muslim nations from entering the U.S. on a temporary basis is continuing to draw much controversy. 
Israel's foreign ministry is requesting clarifications from the U.S. State Department over the new order to see if it applies to Israelis who were born in any of the listed countries. The Israeli embassy in Washington has also reportedly contacted the State Department to clarify the matter. Here at home, dozens of Israelis braved the cold weather last night to protest the recent executive order banning the temporary entry of Muslims from seven countries into America. Protesters gathered outside the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv, lashing out against the newly elected U.S. President's policies, while also taking the opportunity to criticize Prime Minister Netanyahu for what they call his anti-refugee policies. We are standing here protesting in front of the American Embassy in Tel Aviv on behalf of migrants, immigrants and refugees in America, Israel and all over the world against Trump's anti-refugee policies together with Bibi's anti-refugee policies. The plan to allow egalitarian prayer at the Western Wall by Reform and Conservative Jews stands to be canceled. This following a meeting between the head of the ultra-Orthodox parties as well as Agricultural Minister Uri Ariel of the Jewish Home Party and the rabbinate, yes, rabbinate yesterday who called on the Prime Minister to reconsider the matter. The group is demanding that the cabinet cancel the landmark decision for setting up an egalitarian prayer space at the Kotel. Prime Minister, who is under growing pressure from his coalition partners, now has to decide between supporting the Haredim and intensifying the growing rift between Israel and diaspora Jewry, or siding with the High Court of Justice, which ruled that the state needs to implement the Western Wall Resolution and allow freedom of worship at the Kotel. We're well, joining us now in the studio is Anat Hoffman, Executive Director of the Women of the Wall. Anat, thanks so much for joining us. Okay, what does this move by the ultra-Orthodox say to you? Well, when you think that the chief rabbi of Israel has just signed a uh, deal with the authorities that he's going to jail for a variety of ter a terrible things that he's done, I would think the chief rabbis will be sitting and thinking, what, what's wrong with the Rabbanut? How could we have a criminal within, within us for 10 years? Instead, they're thinking of how we can jail women for wearing a talis, like I'm wearing now, or for reading Torah. I think uh, seeing that uh, Netanyahu is weakened by the investigations of corruption, uh, the ultra-Orthodox are thinking this is a good time to pressure him to give even more. Our plan, the agreement that we reached after three years of intense negotiation, is a, actually a, pro a product that we could all be proud of, not just by the uh, bottom line, but also the way we did it. We did it through listening to each other mm -hmm. and actually f a, a having a path towards conciliation. Are you concerned now that Netanyahu is not in a position to fulfill his promise? If he was weak before these investigations and he was, did not implement his government's decision, I don't see him becoming stronger by, these, uh, by the investigations. So I'm afraid that what may happen now is that he's going to criminalize what we're doing and women will go to jail for attempting to read Torah. And I think there, is not a, not, there are not enough cells in the women's jail of Israel to have all the women of the wall who are willing to go to jail for that, uh, to ha have us all in there. Anad, you have received death threats. I mean, what do you think makes the ultra Orthodox so much afraid of this whole movement, the reform of conservative women at the wall? I can tell you what, what's not the issue. There's not an ounce of theology or religious issue here. Nothing here is religion. Any one of these rabbis will tell you that what women of the wall do is halachic. It's according to Jewish law. The problem is not that. The problem is power and funding. And the fact that we're going to offer Israelis a choice. If we have our agreement, there'll be another plaza right next to the existing plaza, and Israelis will be able to choose what kind of Jewish worship do I belong? Where, where do I want to go? Do I want to go where the rabbi is, is in charge of everything and every three-year-old kid has to wear a shmate? Or do I want to go to the egalitarian plaza where people are actually nice? And I think the fear is that people's feet will actually take them to our plaza because there's more than one way to be Jewish in Israel. And we're going to show it at the competition of plazas. Do you think this is a causes belly with, we have a situation with American Jewry who's very upset about this whole issue, but they're not really into ritual. Do they, do they really resonate with, does this resonate with them? 
this whole thing with I the think Kotel? they resonate with the fact that there, uh, there are second-rate Jews in Israel. The fact that the largest movements in the world, the Reform Conservative, are not recognized fully in Israel, that is an insult for them. And at the wall, it is acted out. They actually feel as second-rate citizens. Their kind of worship is not allowed. What kind of nonsense is it? We are making such a terrible mistake with this rift. These, are the, these Jews are the ones who are supporting Israel and defending Israel at the UN and different, uh, in different uh, areas in America, different uh, organizations. How can we not treat them as our brothers and sisters when they come to Israel? So is an egalitarian spot to worship at the Kota enough or are there other areas where you want to see opened up in the rabbinate? Here is the dream of our agreement. One is to liberate the back plaza. The back plaza right now is uh, not open for ceremonies which are not religious. For example, the swearing in of soldiers or the starting of the day of mourning. We'd, a woman was not allowed to speak on the loudspeaker at the wall for the last 40 years. Enough. We would like to liberate that. The second thing is that we want one entrance. We want everyone to come in in one entrance and make up their mind. Do I belong with the Ultra Orthodox Synagogue or do I go to the egalitarian plaza? I think the fear is that we will succeed. Mm. Most people would want to go to our area. Uh, we'd like to have visibility, we'd like to have respect, and I think the court may consider that after 28 years of a struggle, one of the longest struggles in the history of Israel, it's, and we've tried everything, everything but violence. And what kind of a country are we? Only the violent bullies succeed? Well, I'm not Hoffman, Executive Director of the Women of the Wall. Thanks so much for joining IBA News, and we'll have to wait and see how it turns out. In Canada, six people were killed and eight people injured when gunmen opened fire at a local mosque in Quebec City during Sunday night prayers. It remains unclear what's behind the incident, and Canada Prime Minister called, a ter called it a terrorist attack on Muslims. Police said two suspects had been arrested but gave no details about them or what prompted the attack. Investigators are looking into the possibility that there is a connection to the new U.S. administration's policy relating to Muslims. Neighborhood residents who called the attack a pure hate crime stressed the Muslims who attended the mosque are known to get along with their local population. Um, you know, people are going to be a little bit more on edge, but I'm hoping that everybody just comes together on this and, and you know, shows again their support for the community. Uh, because, I mean, that's what we need at this, at this point in time is to show them that uh, we accept them and, you know, they integrate very well with the society. So, again, I'm, I'm very shocked that uh, such an incident has taken place with, uh, with our fellow citizens. King Abdallah of Jordan began an official work meeting in Washington today, the first Arab leader to meet with the new American administration. Today, the king is scheduled to hold a breakfast meeting with Vice President Mike Pence and will later meet with congressional leaders and senators as well as newly appointed Defense Secretary James Mattis. It is unclear whether the king will meet with U.S. President Donald Trump during his visit. Jordanian officials said among the topics to be discussed are the ongoing fight against Islamic State and Russia's role in the Middle East. Officials in Amman said King Abdallah hopes to secure extra resources from the U.S. to assist him in distancing ISIS from Jordan's borders. Prime Minister Netanyahu clarified on Sunday that the Israeli government stands firm behind its position that the U.S. Embassy in Israel should be in Jerusalem. This following accusations by Mark Zell, the co-chairman of the Republicans Abroad Israel Group, who during an interview with Army Radio said that Israel had urged Trump to delay the process. However, speaking in a one-on-one -on -one interview with CBN, Trump made no mention of this, stressing he was seriously reviewing the matter. As it relates to moving this... Jerusalem took on the appearance of a war zone today with piles of garbage strewn across streets in the capital as the Jerusalem municipality workers strike entered its second day. Garbage was piled up on the tracks of the light rail near the Machane Yehuda market and now this gate in the old city, disrupting train surfaces and forcing the light rail to restrict operations, limiting train travel to routes between Pisgat Ze'ev and now this gate in the old city, and the central bus station and Mount Herzl. A request by City Pass to municipality asking them to remove garbage from the tracks was ignored. Meanwhile, a Jerusalem court last night issued a temporary injunct injunction preventing schools in the capital from striking. The strike also affected some 8,000 school pupils in capital who failed to receive meals usually provided daily by the city hall. Elsewhere, garbage trucks and other municipality vehicles parked in the capital streets created chaos and traffic jams. 
The workers are protesting the failure of the finance ministry to transfer the city's 800 million shekel budget for 2017. Former Chief Rabbi Yonah Metzger was convicted in the Jerusalem District Court this morning of suspicions of bribery, fraud, tax evasion, and breach of trust. The former Chief Rabbi pleaded guilty to reduce charges against him after signing a plea bargain deal last week. He is expected to be sentenced to three and a half years in prison and pay a five million shekel fine. Metzger was indicted in October 2015 for accepting some 10 million shekels in bribes and accused of conspiracy to commit a felony, tax violations, obstruction of justice, and money laundering. Police and agents from the Israel Antiquities Authority have successfully nabbed a number of men in Akko with an unusual load of ancient artifacts which they were trying to sell, and the items included cer ceramic pots and coins dating back to the Middle Bronze Age 4,000 years ago. The stolen treasure also included a large number of fake or counterfeit pots, glass lamps, and coins which the men were trying to pass off as ancient. The suspects were questioned to try to find out where the real artifacts were stolen from before they were released on bail. The Antiquities Authority reminds the public that only a few licensed dealers are allowed to sell ancient artifacts, and the catch was further proof of the large counterfeit market in Israel. In finance, shares were mixed in trading today on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, and the shekel was also mixed. Here are the late afternoon numbers. Turning to the weather, and it will be partly cloudy with a drop in temperatures, and there will also be rain and isolated thunder showers throughout the day from the north down to the Negev. It will snow on Mount Hermon, and there are flood warnings in effect for the Dead Sea. Here are the expected highs and lows at home and abroad for the next 24 hours. That's our broadcast for today. Please join us again tomorrow when Laura Cornfield will be at this desk to bring you the latest news from Israel. Until then, I'm Arieh O'Sullivan wishing you a good evening and shalom from Jerusalem.